Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Fritchard, and I'm the Royal Photographic Society's Director of Programmes. The RPS has been running a number of strands of online talks from its award recipients, young photographers, and others working and publishing in photography, such as curators and academics. You can find details of these events and recordings where they're available um, on the Society's website. So we still have a few people arriving, but we will continue. So this evening, it's from my real great pleasure to introduce Dr. Beatrice Prichel. Beatrice is a senior lecturer in photographic history at De Montfort University. And welcome to all of those DMU students and past students who are here this evening. <laughs> She's a photographic historian, but she also has particular interests in the history of medicine and the cultural history of war. Her recent book, Picturing the Western Front, brings together some of this as she seeks to explore individual and group experiences of war through photography. So the plan for this evening is that Beatrice will talk about her research and the book and some of her findings for around 40 to 45 minutes, and we'll then open up to questions. So Beatrice, over to you, thank you. Thanks, thank you, Michael, for the um, introduction. Thank you everyone for coming today. It's 28th of July. You should have better things to do. <laughs> I'm in Madrid, it's very hot, but I think I can manage today. Um, so I start the book Acknowledgements, saying that I became a photographic historian by accident, and I mean it. <laughs> the research for this book started many years ago in 2008, when I was looking for a dissertation project and my supervisor suggested that I could look at photographs. At the time, I knew nothing about photography. My undergraduate degree was in continental philosophy, and I specialized in the history and philosophy of science. I was spending the year in Paris, so I made an appointment at an archive that preserved First World War photographs, um, now known as La Contemporaine. Oops. No. Um, I fell in love. <laughs> Encountering photographic prints and albums for the first time was like nothing I had experienced in my academic life, life before. During those first visits, I particularly liked the personal albums. For instance, this one made by a British woman, Dorothy Allison, who, for, who opened three hospitals in France during the war. The official photographs made by the Military Photographic Service Section Photographic de l'Armée, the SPA, were equally interesting. One of the things I remember more clearly about that period was the feeling that the photographs in the archive always disrupted my own assumptions. I thought, for instance, that personal photographs will tell more than official sources because they were not censored. Um, so, but this proved an incorrect or at least an inaccurate assumption because they're actually quite similar. Um, I also thought that personal albums could, will tell me more about war experiences than official photographs, which I, which I thought were more about information and knowledge rather than experience. And that assumption was wrong too. Another common assumption in related in relation to First World War photography is that it's like too stiff. There's not much action and it's not iconic like the Spanish Civil War or the Second World War photographs. The usual narrative is that Spanish Civil War was the first time that a conflict was extensively covered thanks for, to photographers like Robert Capa, Heather Taro and Tim who created the modern figure of the war photojournalist. I know there are many photo historians in the room. This is an oversimplification, but still there are many iconic pictures of the Spanish Civil War and set Second World War. I have some in the screen that are immediately recognized by the public. There are very few iconic images of the First World War. This might be one of them. However, the First World War was also extensively covered and thousands of pictures were taken in the Western and Eastern fronts as well as the Home Front. 
1914, countries like France had a consolidated photographic industry in a market ready to consume and produce photographs. While France did not dominate the uh, photographic industry anymore at this time, French companies like Gaumont, Pate Frères, Lumière, Eclair, Guillemino, many others, manufactured photographic equipment like cameras and glass plates, um, film and stereoscopic devices used by both for, uh, professional and amateur photographers. The Kodak Vest Pocket, of course, this small foldable camera that Kodak market as the um, soldier's Kodak, Le Kodak du Soldat, was of course very popular also during the war and in France. The Illustrated Press also experienced a boom during the war. This was not the first time that illustrated journals uh, published war photographs. There's a long tradition of that. But they adapted their style to the conflict. Image-driven, cheap journals such, such as Je Vous, that you can see on the screen, um, and others like Sur Le Vif, were created precisely to document their war at this time. Photographs came from press correspondents, military photographers, but also readers who contributed with their own images. Le Miroir and Je Vous encouraged submissions through contests for the most shocking images of the front lines. Both combatants and civilians, therefore, produced and consumed photographs throughout the war, either through the press or in the personal correspondence. My book examines the relationship between practicing photography on the Western Front and the making of war experiences. Many authors before me have already argued that personal photographs are excellent sources to examine how ordinary people experience war. Joël Bourrier, Stéphano Duan Rousseau, Justin Gore, Stanley Callister, Jay Winter, among many others, have written about private photography as a subjective means of expression. Personal photographs seem to be the visual equivalent of written testimony, a sort of access to the photographer's inner life. But how? How exactly does photography constitute individual and collective experiences? My book does not focus on the what of the experience. I don't describe or analyze experiences of fear or camera, there things like that. I'm interested in the how. How do in photography structure combatants and civilians experiences of the war? And I'm afraid I have to say a few words about the concept of experience, which is, as we know, a very debated, discussed term um, in philosophy and theory everywhere. John Scott has famously argued that experience is always historical. It's not universal, and it's definitely not immediately accessible to the historian. Experience is also different from just the raw flow of events, because it's always the result of an elaboration by the subject, who in turn is constituted through experience. While Scott and others have privileged the discursive nature of experience and have focused on the analysis of narratives and language, I privilege practices. And in this regard, I follow recent, um, um, recent research in the history of emotions. For instance, Monique Scheer and others who understand emotions as practices. In this view, emotions are not something that we have, it's something that we do. Rob Bodies has recently argued that this perspective of emotions as practices also helps to open up the concept of experience. So I understand experience as something that we do and that constitute us. I take a practical approach to experience rather than a linguistic or narrative approach to experience. Therefore, 
the answer to my question, how did photography constitute individual and collective experiences, is by practicing photography. That is, taking pictures, posing for them, looking at them in newspapers and galleries, buying, even advertising cameras, composing albums, and so on. This means that I do not only focus on personal photography. Official, press, and even medical photography all contributed to the formation of war experiences. This also means that I am more interested in collective experiences. And in particular, what made some collective experiences possible, and in turn, what hinder the making of collective experiences. I argue that doing photography helped combatants and civilians to turn the raw flow of events into a war experience through five sets of practices, recording, filling, embodying, placing, and making visible and invisible. These five categories constitute, as you can see here, the five chapters of the book. And all, they all describe ordinary functions of photography, but they had particular meanings during the war. In the book, I characterize these photographic practices as frames of experience, the conditions that made possible the making of a war experience as a, as a different category. The first category that I examine is recording. And in particular, the desire to produce visual documents that could become historical evidence. This function is at the core of many uses of photography since the invention of photography. But I focus on the development of this military photographic unit, the Section Photographique de l'Armée, the SPA, created by the Ministry of War, the Foreign Office, and the Finance Department in France in May 1915. The ACPA controlled the production and the distribution of the photographs. So they hired the photographers. They send the photographers to the missions on the home front or the, uh, the Western front, the Eastern front. Um, the picture on the left is one of the photographs. It's an SPA photograph of an SPA photographer on the front lines. But they also developed the photographs and catalog them catalog them and classify them um, at their, in their own facilities in Paris. And you can see on the screen two of these photographs, the SPA photographic laboratory in the middle and the classification room where women were also working. The SPA aimed to photograph everything that could be interesting, and I'm gonna directly quote here, from a historical point of view, from the point of view of visual propaganda, and from the point of view of military operations in order to constitute the documentary archives of the war. So official photography is often examined as propaganda, but I argue that the photographic production of the SPA is better understood from the perspective of the archive. The SPA aimed to photograph everything that had to do with the war in order to cre create the visual archive of the war regardless of the propagandistic potential of the images. This archive had a totalizing ambition, and in fact, it not only classified SPA photographs, but they collected also press photographs and other kinds of photographs. And the aim of this archive was that the historian of the future could have an excerpt image of the war. And again, these are two uh, direct quotes from the documents. The narratives this archive produced through the captions and through the archive categories influenced the public narratives of the war. However, the SPA and the archives um, intention or desire of total control of photography ultimately fail. And part of the reason why the SPA could never contain photography as they wanted is that during the war, photography became an emotional practice. For instance, this is one of my favorite photographs and that's why it's in the cover of the book, um, is 
uh, an amateur photograph of taken by a combatant. And it shows a combatant holding two men. I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, so it's a man holding two men and another one appearing from behind. So this belongs to an amateur album where there are other pictures of fellow combatants, moments of joy, but also distressing moments uh, related to death and injuries. But the way this photograph is state, which is kind of in the middle of anywhere, um, with a chair, if you can see that, which is clearly been placed there on purpose, because again, it's the middle of nowhere. Um, and the amused expressions of the men who are looking at the camera suggest that the joke was not just that one of them was strong enough to hold two men, but also that they have posed like this for the camera. Taking a picture was a way to bond. Similarly, other amateur photographers dedicate another amateur photographer here dedicated a whole album to the memory of Lieutenant George, who had died in Verdun. So this amateur photographer collected all the photographs that he had of Lieutenant George, um, and especially portraying the moments that they spent together, remembering their favorite activities like fishing or swimming. And they also took images of the hospital in which he died. Oh, here's the reference. So in this case, photography mediated the way he processed grief. Photography also became a technology of embodiment, a technology that not only provided representations of bodies, but also facilitated centered bodily encounters. The clearest example is the photography of the dead. As we might expect, the photography of the German dead was very different from the photography of the French. German bodies were um, usually portrayed as victims of violence. They always may have buried, abandoned on the ground. They're like very, they're the most graphic um, images. Very few SPA photographers took images of the French victims, but these photographs became an essential element in the war archive. These images gave a material and visual body to the notion mort pour la France, dead for France, with a legal status for the word dead that warranty rights to relatives like pensions. And I will talk about this um, more in detail later. Amateur photographers also articulated their relationship to the dead differently in the case of German and French bodies. And on the screen, I have two examples of an amateur album um, on, so in this case, the photographer took a close up of a German body after photographing the attack that killed him, in which he had participated. And that's the image on the uh, left. If you can see, um, there are images of the attack, it's a mine, the mine war, and images 12, 13, and 14 are German cadavers, and especially image 14, which is again very explicit, and I shall have. Uh, use a trigger warning. Um, you can see on the um, bottom left corner the shadow of the photographer. So the order in which the photographs are taken and the explicit violence of these German bodies, um, I think they give, a they illustrate, um, they give a visual narrative uh, to the duty to kill, to this fact that they, they, they were there killing, the dead were not just uh, their victims. However, on the right, you can see our dead, the French bodies, which were photographed very differently. Uh, they are ready uh, for burial. They are completely anonymous. You don't see their faces like you do in the German bodies. And while these photographs, the, um, mean different things um, if they're taken by amateur photographers than if they were taken by official photographers. Um, it's really interesting that actually 
the visual style is very similar. So they are using the same visual codes, but for different reasons. Photography also help to help also help to place oneself in the environment. Years of fighting on the Western Front profoundly changed the French landscape. Photographs of ruined villages and broken trees presented viewers with images that mobilized a new geographical imaginary of France, dominated by the destruction of its natural and man-made heritage. Beyond representations, for practicing photography also helped combatants to develop a new sense of place. Doing photography on the front lines or consuming images from the home, uh, from the home front helped combatants and civilians to reconstruct their relationship to the environment through different visual and tactile engagements. So images taken from behind the trenches and published on the press, like the image uh, the right image on the screen, aerial photographs, stereoscopic photographs, they all helped civilians to feel like they were there, they were seeing and experiencing a familiar landscape in a completely different way. And I really like this um, headline that how um, battles are changing the appearance of a landscape. And finally, photography made some things visible while making others invisible. And this might seem counterintuitive. Photographs are mostly valued for their images. So it might seem that making visible was the primary function of photography. But I argue the contrary. Photographic visibility matter only because making visible involved a whole set of photographic practices recording, feeling, embodying, and placing. In contrast, making invisible meant the absence of those practices. Visibility, therefore, does not refer to what is seen, but to what is experienced. Photographic practices thus created these this, um, frames of experience. What photographs show, as well as the relations into which photographers, photograph, and viewers enter through photography and through all these different practices, they limited what could and could not be collectively acknowledged as war experiences. Recording, feeling, embodying, placing, and making visible and invisible, therefore, are not just functions of photography, but the way in which combatants and civilians, civilians transform the flow of what they live into war experiences. In the fifth chapter of the book, I illustrate the dynamics of making visible and invisible by comparing the photographic representation of the war missing with the lack of photography of suicide. And I will examine them now in more detail. The first magazine to publish the portraits of the war missing was Sur le Vif, one of these journals that were created during the war. In its first issue, which appeared on 14 November 1914, so only a few months after uh, war broke out, Sur le Vif offered to publish the portraits of officers or soldiers, fathers, brothers, husbands, fiancés, who had gone missing during the war in case someone should recognize them and offer um, information on their location. All that families had to do was to send a photograph of the missing person together with the necessary explanations like last name, name, regiment, and company. The following week, Sur Levy published the first batch of portraits of the glorious war missing that you can see on the screen. It consisted of 24 portraits organized in a grid. Every portrait had a registry number, which was a scribble on the picture, usually on the color of the uniform or on their suits. Below the portraits, a list matched the registry numbers with personal details like 
names, regiments, um, and the date and the place where they, uh, had, where the man had gone missing. Subsequent issues kept the same format, progressively multiplying the number of portraits. The next series included 40 images, um, which increased to 48 the following week. And in May 1915, um, it reached 210 portraits per week. Again, all in the same on the same page. From the end, uh, from the end of uh, October 1915, Sur Le Vif published a series of portraits only sporadically. The reduction in the number of images and the series' eventual removal coincide with the creation of a new association for the war missing and the publication of its own journal, La Recherche de Disparus, which also published the portraits of the missing. I examined that journal in the book, but I won't talk, won't talk about it in, the, in this talk. I found Sur Le Vive use of photography really interesting and fascinating. Early on, it had asked readers to send photograph, uh, photographs of a small size. However, by the look of some portraits and especially the ones on the left, it seems that not all families follow these instructions and sent larger images or even group uh, portraits that then had to be cropped. So Leviv organized all the photographs in a grid in order to fit as many images as possible. And as you can see on the image um, on the right, at one point, all backgrounds became neutral white. The cropping, manipulation, and organization of images effectively turned these personal private images into public mug shots. Images focused on the face intended to identify the subject. The operations resulted in the standardization of portraits, which emphasized the similarities between the men. This idea of treating all the soldiers in the same way was also present in all their aspects of military life particularly in cemeteries where the homogenization of tombs meant that all the dead were the same, regardless of military rank and so on. However, the standardization of portraits had no negative consequences for the identification of these men because they basically all look the same. As the number of portraits increased, they became smaller and the quality of the reproduction deteriorate, deteriorated hindering the likelihood of recognizing them. The numerical system was also problematic as it relied on either visually identifying the men, then corresponding the image with the name in the list, or the other way around, going through the list and then taking the portraits. In any case, someone had to spend a great amount of time going through all the portraits and names published in Sur Le, Bui, Sur Le Bif. Um, so Leviv was also published weekly and they um, renew the portraits every week, which means that readers have to keep up to date or collect the, collect the information pages, hoping that they could remember and identify the men. So the publication of these portraits was flow, but it offers a really good example of how photography's ability to make things visible articulated war experiences. Disappearance was an uncertain state, which could neither confirm nor deny the death of the missing. Missing soldiers were literally out of sight and the photographic portraits made them visible in the public sphere. Their status was still uncertain, but the circulation of photographs acknowledged at least their existence. Through the circulation, the meaning of the portraits Changed as did the identity of these men who went from being husbands, fathers, sons to soldiers to missing soldiers. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, suicide. So there's a big trigger warning. Uh, there's only one image, uh, not very graphic, but um, there's the trigger warning. 
Um, and there's only one image because um, unlike the war missing or the other war dead, suicide was never photographed. As many historians have pointed out, suicide was a taboo and sources are often silent about it. But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Denis Golan has estimated that around 50,000 um, soldiers died by suicide only in France. It is a figure difficult to calculate because suicide was not always recorded as such. In July 1915, the French government created the legalist status Mort pour la France, death for France, um, which as, as I say earlier, recognized that someone, a combatant or a civilian, had been killed by the enemy or had died under circumstances directly related to the war. It was a really important status because it warranted rights to relatives, such as um, pensions for widows and orphans. And it also warranted a place in public commemorations. Those whose death could not be considered as related to the war or had not been killed by the enemy were not considered mort pour la France. So they didn't have access to all these things. The problem with suicide besides the taboo, is that it was not considered an effect of the war experience. It was not a war event. Most French psychiatrists, which are the main group that wrote about suicide, they believe that the reason why men died by suicide was their hereditary disposition to experience mental disorders rather than the experience of the war itself. So they could have die by suicide in other circumstances. Therefore, they could not receive the legal status mort pour la France. This makes the study of suicide through death certificates really difficult. If a soldier had died in a hospital and the medical staff um, suspected that the cause had been suicide, they sometimes left the cause of death as undecided, um, probably to avoid all these issues. For instance, um, and he aged A, and I have anonymized um, the certificate, died on 26 December 1915 at the medical center Val de Gras. According to the death certificate that you can see on the screen, he died due to suicide after an illness contracted at war but he rec his records appears as undecided. This idea that the war was not the cause of suicide explains to a certain point why there are no photographs um, of suicide. In the medical context, and now I'm gonna share the image. Oh, sorry, that's where it says suicide. In the medical context, um, this image, which is the only photograph I have ever seen of suicide or related to suicide at this period. This photograph makes sense as part of the forensic examination that determined the cause of death. That was a routine procedure for this kind of uh, deaths, but also um, with some mutilations that were suspected to be self-inflicted. But this is the only scenario where suicide was photographed. The SBA did not photograph the bodies because its mission was to document all the war events and suicide was not officially part of the war. In relation to amateur and press photography, the photographic silence is similar to the silence we find in other testimonies. It was probably just too, too hard to talk about and to relate. But more important, I think, are the effects of making suicide invisible in the public sphere. The photographic absence of suicide speaks about the place of suicide in French society, as well as the role of photography in articulating collective experiences. Publishing the photographs, um, sorry. By publishing the photographs, 
of the war missing in journals, photography made this man visible. And through this visibility, they enter into the documentation of the war. They now belong to the war missing, a different category from combatants. They also engage in new, different emotional relations with others. For instance, the readers who are compelled by Sucre Vif to feel sympathy for them and their families. The bodily identity of this man, consequently changed, most visibly in the photographic operations carried out by the magazine to crop uh, backgrounds and transform these private, these personal pictures into mug shots. Finally, their sense of place completely changed. Um, their location was still unknown, but their images were distributed all around France in the home front the, um, and the, um, the Western front, in hospitals, everywhere. Making visible, um, making the war miss invisible was not only about people seeing them, but also about acknowledging them and their existence in the public sphere. In contrast, the lack of photographic documentation of suicide implied that no one was there to take the pictures, circulate them, paste them into albums, scribble dates on them, as we can see with any other picture. No one kept a visual record for the archives. The effective relationships in which photographers, photograph subjects and viewers enter were non-existent in this case. Suicide victims were not given a new body um, as other casualties were, as we have seen, and they were not placed anywhere. Obviously, making this man invisible in photography did not mean that the relatives would not grieve them, because of course they did. But yet, the lack of photography prevented a public acknowledgement of suicide, and therefore a collective experience that could make sense of it. Making visible and invisible was important not just because of what could be seen, but also because they were performative practices that involved recording, feeling, embodying, and placing. Conclusion. <laughs> Writing this book uh, took way too many years. I think I sent the first book proposal in to Manchester in 2015. The writing has been very hard and my wonderful colleagues at PHOC and the Immune History, some of them are here. They can attest to my many complaints of writing this book. But actually, in the end, I'm very happy that I was able to do what I always wanted to do to understand how photography articulates experiences. But that's it. This, is, this does not belong to me anymore. And I really hope more and more scholars engage with these materials because there is much more to say about First World War photography. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Beatrice, for um, talking about the book and, and talking through the, the individual chapters there. Um, there's some questions that are coming to me directly, so I'm going to pick up with some of those and then I'll come to the questions that I can see are already coming through on the chat. Um, so the first question that I've got here is, um, are you aware of any um, information regarding how successful the Sylvie portraits were in finding some of the, the missing? Um. Yes, thanks for that question. Um, actually, there are some good news stories, both in, um, in Sur Le Vivre and in La Recherche de Disparus, they published some good news stories. But for instance, in Sur Le Vivre, it's always the same good news story. So um, I'm not sure it was that effective. And in the other one, they publish these new stories. They say, you know, they publish the photograph of the man. They say that he's been located. Uh, but if you look at the previous issues, um, the family had just sent a picture. Um, so the journal hadn't uh, published the photograph by the time he 
was um, fun. So actually, it kind of, they took the credit, but they didn't really do it. <laughs> um, so I don't know how, um, how effective they were. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to interject here as well. I mean, do you think it was much more about memorializing those missing people as opposed to really expecting them to be found or located? I think, yes. On the one hand, there is this um, memorializing or at least kind of giving them some credit and saying, look, all these men are missing. And especially during the first years of the war, it's a really big issue. But I think there are also some business reasons behind that, because obviously, if you want to identify the, um, the men, you need to keep buying the magazine. And to send the pictures, you need to send, buy the magazine and then um, send the, the form that comes with the magazine. So I don't want, I don't want to be like super cynical and say it was a completely economic reason, but I don't think it didn't hurt in that regard. I think the, uh, the economics often underlie some of these activities and initiatives. Um, so the other question that's come through directly to me before I come to the questions coming through online um, is whether you've had, uh, a lot of the work you've done was rooted obviously in the French archives and um, our question is asking whether you had, have had the opportunity to, to make any comparisons with UK archives or have you, are you aware of any differences across between countries and perhaps across cultures in the way that these the, the photography was undertaken? Yeah, so I should say, first of all, that, you know, I focus on France, but I think that this international comparison, someone needs to do it <laughs> because these stories are usually written on this country did this, this country did that. Um, so I think it's time for an international comparison of that. Having said that, um, especially with official photography, I think there's a clear contrast between what uh, France does and what um, Britain and I think even Canada do. Um, for instance, in France, I say that they organize this whole system. So they hire photographers, they, had, um, they hire the laboratory technicians, they, have, they hire the archivists, they hire administration people. It's a whole thing and they take the pictures, they develop them, they do all the enlargement crop and so on, and they circulate them, um, send it to magazines, send it to neutral countries, uh, they even do their own publications. But um, in Britain, they actually just gave um, personal permits to some war photographers. So it was on a case by case basis saying, okay, you can go and you can do, you can, you know, go there, take some pictures, bring them back uh, to um, Wellington House. So I think that that is a big difference in how at least this side of photography, um, this official photography works because um, while for, um, the UK was more propagandistic and it was all photojournalists doing some photojournalist uh, pictures um, in the Western Front used for propaganda. In France, because they had this whole system, I think the archives then were really important. But I'm sure there are more um, differences and I would love to read about them. <laughs> future project but there's coming to our questions online now um alan crichton is asking whether you've had the chance to study british german war photogra photographs given that the strict censorship in britain um, it appears that both official and personal photography was much more relaxed than britain allowed yeah i have encountered this um this comment before um what I can say about France is that uh, censorship, at least for images, was not what we think it is. Um, so there was definitely censorship, but it was more focused on military information and strategic information. So it's not about, it's not as much about morale or like um, graphic images that they don't want the people to see. It's more about, you know, um, you can see a particularly good weapon, weapon in this um, picture, 
or they reveal their location. So this is not allowed. Um, but also with magazines, um, Joel Bourrier has written about that. They usually send the proofs, uh, the pages last minute. So sometimes they didn't have the time to really censure <laughs> um, them. So I think, yeah, it was a bit more relaxed. <laughs> Um, and Sebastian Dobson is asking, uh, he's saying, I was wondering whether the widespread mutinies in the French army in 1917 were represented in the photographic record. Were they acknowledged perhaps in the form of photographs of executions of mutineers or deserters or simply made invisible? Um, that's a really good question. And when I started doing this research, I thought, OK, that's an, that would be another clear uh, case of like invisible events. Um, but it's not exactly the same, precisely because um, the mutinies and the um, the executions were le fusillés, um, pour l'example. So it's like they wanted to make an example of the uh, people uh, that the certain and executed and all these kind of things. So actually in the press, you can see some pictures. It's not a widely photographed thing. And I don't think I have seen any official photograph of that because why they will want that in their archive of the war. Um, but definitely some pictures in the press. So again, they escape censorship. So it was not that systematic invisibilization that suicide had. Um, Sarah Dominci is commenting that in Britain the YMCA ran the snapshots from Home, Home League as part of which local amateur photographers took pictures of families of those at the front and then forwarded them onto them. Was there something similar in France? Not to my knowledge, no. It was more um, you wanted to take pictures, you buy your own camera and then um, go there. It's um, Again, because it's France, it's very centralized. So for instance, while photography, um, amateur photography was uh, forbidden on military zones and war zones, they actually created a system of permissions. Um, so you could apply and say, I want to use my Kodak Quest pocket um, just to take pictures for myself. I'm not going to circulate it. I'm not going to send them to the press and they gave them a permission for like three months and then renew it. Um, obviously, they then send it to the press, um, but on paper, they say that it was just private use. So yeah, it was more like this centralized system of permissions. Um, so Jason Bates is just commenting that in Britain, there was the Defense of the Realm Act, which heavily censored unofficial stroke amateur photographers. Um, I think that's a comment, but I'm just going to go on to Jennifer Wallace's question. Um, firstly, she's thanking you for the uh, presentation and, and this obviously you know what she means, but she says that a death related <laughs> question from me, obviously. Was there any circulation of death imagery like a covenant with death? I think that with that was also in World War One and circulated in Britain, which compiled a variety of war and death images for public consumption, but not as an obvious anti-war statement like war against war, if that makes sense. Hi, Jen. It makes sense. <laughs> um, no, the short answer, I think it's going to be no. May, there might be an obscure publication that I haven't seen, um, but while um, most of these, the photographs of especially French uh, victims were censored, so they, they weren't allowed uh, for publication. Actually, in the magazines, they run lots of um, photographs of the dead. So, yeah, there's not like, I haven't seen one specific about that, but they circulated, they definitely circulated. Um, and then just coming back to the amateur photography that was undertaken, do you have a sense or has it become apparent through the research what the, who the intended audiences were? Was it just for family or were they intended for wider circulation in some form? Mm. Yeah, so 
there are some that are clearly like more family or more personal, um, but especially because some journals um, wanted to have photographs uh, from readers and especially photographs from the front lines and especially like shocking images they they love these images of explosions for <laughs> capture in on the moment these things um i think that was a real incentive um for instance well let me um and also je vu they both offer cash um cash prices for the most most uh, shocking images the best images so i think some of them were definitely to be seen um, by others and one of the albums that i have talked about here he um, starts it's a collection of five albums six um, and he starts saying these are all uh, authentic photographs taken by me um, a veteran of the mine um, corpse and they haven't been sent to anywhere else. Like they're authentic and, and inedit. Um, they haven't seen, um, which is actually not true <laughs> because I've seen one of these pictures published in one of the journals that publish amateur photographs. Um, so yeah, I think some of them were definitely to be widely seen. And in, in general, though, was was the amateur photography, um, was it particular types of subjects, except where there might have been a commercial reason why they were sending pictures back? You know, typically amateurs will generally take pictures on a nice sunny day and, and they're happy pictures. Is there a particular type of subject or aesthetic that amateurs are doing in that type of situation? Well, in that, the, uh, the images for the press, they try to get like, yeah, an explosion, for instance, or they love the images that I think I've, say, I've shown um, from behind the trenches. So you can see like, the, there's a hole on the wall and you take a picture, like, this is what I see from here. Um, these are the kind um, of images they want. There's, or, or maybe sometimes during, even during an attack, they try to get that. Um, but these are just the photographs that are published in magazines. The, the problem with um, using this illustrated magazine like Sur Le Bif or Le Miroir, these kind of things for as sources is that they never credited the photographs. Only in rare, on rare occasions, like this one, for instance, that they say, yeah, someone sent us this picture but actually they never do. So you don't really know if it's an amateur photograph or just a press correspondent or what I've seen in the albums um, is that, yeah, there's some like that, but as you say, it's more like, this is my regiment. These are my friends. <laughs> this is uh, our shower here. We are cooking. <laughs> this is, um, these are more the kind of pictures. Well, this is a cemetery, but these are more the kind of pictures that you encounter. And actually, there's a nice follow-up question from Gil asking whether there's any evidence mm -hmm. that photographs were faked to get money offered for images. I haven't seen evidence that they were faked, but one of the photographs published, I should have included in the PowerPoint because I, I talk about it in the book. Um, it's a photograph of two... Um, Two combatants, I think, that have been just injured, and there's a bit of a still a bit of a smoke. Um, and they publish the image and they also like enlarge, and then also the, the whole image of the glass plate by saying that you know this was sent by one of our um, readers and it was uh, it is authentic and we are reproducing faithfully. Um, the image. So I guess in that sense, if they're saying, hey, this is not fake, it's because there are criticism that some of them are fake. Um, but that's as far as I can get. <laughs> and, and or staged perhaps rather than fate? I mean, everything is a state. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think um, there's a 
probably have brought a final question from Timothy Benson. Um, firstly, thanking you for the, the very thoughtful presentation and looking forward to getting hold of a copy of your book. Um, and you'll see a, a discount code in the uh, chat for anyone that needs to buy a copy, and I hope that's everyone. Um, but Tim, Timothy's asking, um, just in general, images of dead soldiers were allowed in the popular press if identified as enemy. Have you seen similar manipulation of amateur images of press via captions, etc.? Um, no, I think I don't know if I understand the question. Um, ah, okay. So saying that it's a German, but it is a French body. No, no way. There, that's. I mean, this. I guess the. The uniforms are different, so the readers will catch that. But also, I think they're too respectful for that. <laughs> um, so I haven't, I don't have evidence of that. Maybe it happened, but I don't have any evidence. Okay. And I think that's probably an appropriate uh, place to draw things to a conclusion. So firstly, <laughs> on behalf of the RPS, I'd like to thank you for um, talking to us all this evening and sharing some of the insights in, into what you've put in your rather excellent and wonderful book. Um, I'd also like to thank Manchester University Press for making available a discount code for anyone that does want to buy the book. It's a very, very generous discount of 40%, so do take advantage of that. <laughs> I can see lots of people or several people holding up copies of the book, so um, buy a second copy. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a good read in a sense that it's it's academic, but it's it's very readable and, and easy to get into um, some of the themes that Beatrice has been talking about this evening. So thank you. And again, thank you to our audience for joining us this evening and for your questions as well. So good night, everyone. Thank you. And lots thank of you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs>